All right, so any questions from uh, any material from the last section? Went over the, some of the pulmonary stuff, infectious disease, anything? Okay, um, so we'll finish up with that section and then we'll kind of go seamlessly into the, the next one uh, about hematology drugs. Um, so you guys will have to switch over slides uh, partway through. So the first thing uh, we'll talk about today is anaphylaxis treatment. Have you guys had any, any experience with treating anaphylaxis or at least talked about it somewhat? You guys will at least probably be familiar with the process. But, um, essentially what we, we know about this is you know, a very severe systemic allergic reaction. Um, it's gonna involve lots of different uh, systems, but mainly the airway is probably gonna be one of the biggest things we're worried about. And then kind of secondary, the cardiovascular system because um, we're about things like hypotension and shock and, and things like that. Um, Obviously, though, if the patient's having a complete obstruction of the airway and they're not breathing, that's going to be the big first thing that's going to get them. Um, obviously, there's lots of different things that can be involved in these reactions, um, namely, you know, skin <laughs> contact with certain products, inhalation, ingestion, um, specifically, you know, uh, specific medications if they have previous allergic reactions to them. Obviously, we know they're more at risk for having anaphylactic reactions in, in the future. Um, you guys know the signs and symptoms, I'm sure, but uh, certainly we're going to be seeing lots of edema happening, and that's due to a lot of the vasodilation that's happening. Again, all those mast cells are degranulating, releasing all those inflammatory cytokines. So you have vasodilation, edema, swelling, all this good stuff. Um, obviously, you know, if you hear someone having strider, like it's a big warning sign. That should be a big clue that, hey, something bad's going on here. Um, and then we'll also have cardiovascular collapse being kind of the one of the most common peri-arrest manifestations. So hypotension, um, they get bradycardic or tachycardic? They usually get tachycardic, right? So they're hypotensive, tachycardic, because again, the heart's trying to keep up uh, with that cardiac output due to that decrease in that uh, total peripheral resistance. Um, you can also see some gastrointestinal signs as well. So we'll look at some of the medications we can use for that. Um, but mainly you're gonna see a lot of vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain can be associated with that as well. Um, here's some pictures of people who are experiencing some anaphylaxis. Again, if you see that, that should be a big warning sign that maybe you should do something about that sooner than later. <laughs> Just a thought. Um, so first thing you're going to do probably after you kind of, um, once you're kind of assessing your A, Bs, and Cs, um, one of the first uh, medications you might apply are, is going to be for some volume expansion, especially if they're hypotensive, um, in which case we're going to be using some IV crystalloids. And when I say crystalloids, does that mean anything to you guys? There's two different varieties. There's colloids and there's crystalloids. Crystalloids are basically salt solutions. So if you're lactated ringers, um, if you had like D5 half of 20 AK, like that can still be considered to be a crystalloid. Normal saline, namely being this 0.9% sodium chloride as considered normal saline, um, that would be a crystalloid. Colloids would be things that are more like kind of protein based. So if you had like albumin or if you had head of starch, things like that, that would be considered a colloid. Typically for volume expansion, uh, especially like you know an emergency type situation like this, um, unless you have some issue where you don't have enough serum proteins, like this is really what you're going to go with is with your crystalloids, um, namely sodium chloride probably being your your first go-to one. If you're in kind of the surgical setting, these a lot more lactated ringers, but here uh, more of the emergency cases, NACL will will work for our cases. Um, why do they call it normal saline? Isotonic. Yeah, absolutely. So it's isotonic to the blood, right? So um, if you're looking at what's kind of the normal serum osmolarity of blood, oh, God. I heard. I think I heard the number, 300. like th around 300 milliosmoles per liter, right? So um, the nice thing when you look at sodium chloride is if you uh, basically, if you look at the number of milliequivalents per liter, if you look, you have 154 milliequivalents per liter of sodium, and then you have 154 milliequivalents of chloride, so you end up getting roughly around. 300, right? So that's why it's kind of isotonic. You don't see a ton of fluid shift. We'll, we'll talk more about this later, but this, just for our purposes, this is why we use it for volume expansion because 100% of it's mainly going to be staying in the intravascular space once we apply it. So if you have any kind of hypotension, if they're tachycardic, typically you're going to want to go ahead and tank them up with some fluids here. So how much do you give, right? Like if I just had a random uh, patient, how much fluid would you say to give them? So you probably give them a liter, right? Leader might not be good for everyone though, right? So you might have patients who have, say, renal dysfunction, who might be too much, lead to fluid overload. Um, one liter might not be enough for some of your larger patients, for sure. So a good number to keep in mind, and this is, uh, holds for children, it holds for adults, um, you wanna start with around 20 mLs per kilogram. This is a very good number to know when you're out there in the clinical world. And someone says, oh, I need a fluid bolus, how much are you gonna give? 20 mLs per kilogram is a good number. 
usually for an adult patient, once you start in car start capping out at around two liters or so, that'll be like kind of your initial uh, bolus, and then you can bolus later with additional fluids if you need to. In some cases, for really profound hypotension, you may need four or eight liters of fluids, um, and you just keep giving it to the patient, and they'll, you know, um, uh, keep trying to fill up that intravascular space because so much of it is just leaking out because of that that those leaky vessels that they have do that the hypotension there. So and then the next question is well you give them maintenance or you give them a bolus you try to tank them up and then how much do you give as far as maintenance fluid goes right? So then we had this nice rule which is also good to remember for in the clinical world is this four two one rule. Have you guys ever heard of this before? Very good numbers to know. So essentially, how do you figure out the maintenance fluids? Is that for the first ten kilograms of the patient's weight, you're going to give four mLs per kilo. Right, so if I had a 10 kilogram child, what would be their maintenance fluid rate? 40, 40 mLs, right? 40 mLs an hour, okay? Um, after that, for the next 10 kilograms, you're gonna do two mLs per kilogram. So if I had a 20 kilogram child, what would be their fluid maintenance rate? And be 60 per hour, right? Because you're having 40 for the first 10 kilograms and then you get 20 for the next 10 kilograms, right? So 60 mLs per hour would be their, their maintenance rate. And then for the any kilogram amount after that, you're gonna do one mL per kilogram, right? So if I had, say, a 30 kilogram child, you get 40 for the first 10, 20 for the next 10, and then you get another 10 for the additional 10 kilograms. So then it'd be 70 mLs per hour, right? And so I will ask you to calculate this on the test, but you should be able to do it in your head. It's pretty easy. Right? So say for instance, if I had a 60 kilogram patient, the way you'd figure that out is you do 40 mLs per hour for the first 10 kilograms, you do 20 for the next uh, 10 kilograms, and then you do an additional 40 mLs per hour for every kilogram after that. Does that make sense? You can't ever go wrong by doing this method. Um, for some patients, especially with like pretty significant renal dysfunction, you may need to do less than that, but for most of your generally healthy patients, um, this is a good number to know. So especially like when I'm um, working with a lot of like say post-op orders and they wanna do post-op fluids uh, for these patients, you're doing these calculations over and over and over in your head because you have kids that are you know 18 kilograms, so how much do they need? You know, so you do you know, 40 for the first 10 and then you do two times eight, so an additional 16, so say 56 mLs an hour. And so you guys will get better better with this as you do it more and more. So do like some practice scenarios because um, it will ask you to do this on the test. You, don't, you shouldn't really need a calculator for it, right? Okay, any questions on that? Good rules to remember. Uh, the next drug we're gonna be giving is epinephrine and everyone's probably heard of this drug before, but certainly it's an endogenous catecholamine, meaning we all have it within our body. So uh, if you ever have someone who says they have an F and F or an allergy, does that make sense? No. Shouldn't be, they, because they should be dead, right? That actually does make sense though, because usually if you have something, uh, someone has an allergy to a product, um, that doesn't really make sense because it's an endogenous product. So say they have like an insulin allergy. Usually there's some kind of other uh, inactive ingredient in the product that is actually causing the allergy. So um, in certain epinephrine products to, uh, to extend the expiration date, they use preservatives. And so one of them has a sulfite preservative um, that some people can have a bad reaction to. So if you ever hear that, it's probably what they're having a reaction to is these sulfites. And so you can end up finding sulfite-free products you can actually give to these patients and they, and they do just fine because obviously they don't have an allergy to the epinephrine, it's just the drug product that they received. So the big things that they're gonna be doing with this drug is it's gonna be working kind of in a balanced manner on both your alpha and your beta receptors, right? So this is gonna be good for um, alpha one, beta-2 receptors, right, because their airway is closing up, so you want to cause some bronchial smooth muscle relaxation, um, and also have some effects on the beta-1 receptors in the heart as well. So what you should expect to see is some vasoconstriction from the alpha-1 effects, and so hopefully you're going to have some decreased vasopermeability, so that's going to help out with some of that edema, right, that's happening, because your vessels are just wide open, they're very, very leaky, so hopefully we're going to deal with some of that. And then from the beta effects, you're really looking for that bronchial smooth muscle relaxation. So similar um, to if you already give something like a beta-2 agonist, like albuterol for asthma, same thing we're, we're basically doing here. And also help to relieve some of the pruritus or to carry an angioedema uh, that, that is occurring here as well. So obviously this is like our EpiPens. Has anyone heard like the big controversy with the EpiPen recently? Kind of what happened? 
Jack. Yeah, they're trying to jack up the price, and everyone's like, oh, no, my, everyone's going to die because they can't get their EpiPens. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that goes on uh, along with that because, like, EpiPen really, that was, like, the big brand name in town. And so if they didn't have insurance coverage, it could be very, very expensive to cover it. Um, in a lot of cases, even though the prices are being jacked up, if you have insurance, oftentimes they're making deals kind of behind the scenes in order to make this kind of, like, the preferred product in a lot of cases. But anyway, there, you know, sometimes you'll see your controversy about kind of um, – uh, drugs like this, which primarily only come with, with a um, kind of one brand name product. And the EpiPens, what's kind of the nice thing about the EpiPens? As far as dosage forms go. Single dose. Single dose, you administer it to yourself or, you know, if you're a uh, parent, you could do it to a small child. Um, gives you nice intramuscular injection of, of epinephrine. Um, so this is really nice for you to have. If you have a patient who has known anaphylactic allergies, you know, to peanuts or whatever happens to be out in, in the environment. Um, so epinephrine is typically given. Um, it can be given IM, can be given sub-Q. Typically, those are going to be your preferred routes for anaphylaxis. Really, IM is going to be your best way to go because um, you remember when we talked talked about pediatrics um, a long time ago in pharmacodynamics. Um, you guys remember that good blood flow to the muscles is really necessary to have good absorption of the drug, right? Because if blood's not really flowing to the muscle, it's not really um, going to absorb all that well. It's going to be erratic at the very least. So if you imagine if you're hypotensive because you're having an anaphylactic reaction, where is your body peripherally shunting blood to? The head and the heart, right? So it's not going to necessarily go to your thigh. It's going to potentially be clamping down there in order to help uh, shunt that blood flow back. So um, IM is really going to be the preferred route, um, but in case you have cases, you know, patients having, you know, is either coding or they have really severe hypotension, um, you may see IV doses being given, right? So, so you know that there's not a good circul peripheral circulation in anaphylaxis, that's where you want your drug to sit? Well, when you're giving it, you're also flushing fluid behind it, so typically that's helping to kind of push stuff through. Um, you know, if they were coding, you're also doing CPR, which is presumably trying to get some kind of blood flow going, um, albeit it's not going to be as good as if the person had actually perfusing rhythm, obviously. So you do the best you can, basically. Um, now, this is actually the a lot of the, the marketing is moving away from using these concentrations, but essentially um, you used to see concentrations expressed as this ratio, where you'd have 1 to 1,000, 1 to 10,000, 1 to 100,000 concentrations. And so if you saw that on a drug product, what would that mean to you? A lot, no one knows, really. No one really knows what that actually means. Um, <laughs> so because of that, because most people didn't know what that ratio meant, and because there's so much risk in having tenfold, hundredfold overdoses or underdoses, they're getting away from this. So they're actually moving to having uh, much more explicit concentrations expressed on there. So um, you see like on the epi panels, say 0.3 milligrams, and you look at a vial of epinephrine, it would say one milligram in 10 mLs, right? So you have a better idea of what the actual dose is per the volume. So um, just so you guys know, like when you're looking at uh, these concentrations, you may still see this out there, and, and a lot of people will probably still talk using this vernacular because it's been so ingrained for so many decades. Um, basically what that means is there's one gram of medication per that volume of, say, saline. So uh, for the 1 to 1,000, you're basically having one gram of uh, epinephrine per 1,000 mLs, okay? That's not really all that clinically useful to you guys when you're thinking about it. So the way that I remember this stuff is that I know how many milligrams are in how many mLs based on that ratio. So for instance, if I'm looking at a 1 to 1,000 concentration, I know I have one milligram of epinephrine and one mL of saline, or one mL of fluid. If I have a 1 to 10,000, I know I have 1 milligram in 10 mLs. That makes sense? Mm, no. So always go with that. You said the 1 to 1,000 was 1 in a liter or a gram. I guess milligram. I see exactly, you're yeah. When you actually do the math and you, you cancel out the zeros and all that, it's going to be 1 milligram <laughs> per 1 ml or... Yeah, one milligram per 10 mLs. And so, as you can imagine, if you look at like a code cart, like a you know, pretty standard code cart in any hospital, you would have these vials of, say, pre drawn up epinephrine, which are one to 10,000. So you have one milligram and a whole 10 mLs in that syringe. And then you also have a vial that's one to 1,000 that you can use to make epi drips and things like that. So I remember one time I had to, um, you know, for typical adult code, you give the full milligram, right? So you just go ahead and just push the whole 10 mLs to it for a patient. Um, one time I was working in the ER, we had a patient who's coding, and um, there was a nurse who was manning the, the code tray, and she goes, oh, am I supposed to use this whole thing to make the epi drip? And the other nurse was like, yeah, yeah, use the whole thing. Didn't realize that they were talking about two different concentrations and two different products. So when she intended, the other nurse who was not looking at the drugs intended to have just one of those syringes of the one to 10,000, which is just one milligram in total, go into a bag to make an epi drip. The other nurse thought, oh, I'm gonna use this whole vial of 30 mLs or 30 milligrams of epinephrine. 
big difference, right? 30 milligrams versus one milligram. Um, that patient would, was probably going to die anyway. Um, <laughs> But fortunately, we caught it before we actually gave it, so it really didn't make that big of a difference. But as you can imagine, having good closed loop communication could have prevented that from occurring anyway. Um, so just keep those concentrations in mind. Remember what you're talking about when you're when you're expressing these things to different providers, because that can make a huge difference here. So. Um, Anyway, so other things you can see, um, oh, and typically when you're going to be given IV doses, you're going to use the less concentrated form. So you're going to be using um, that 1 to 10,000 or that 1 milligram per 10 mLs. For usually with sub-Q administration or IM administration, you want to use things that are more concentrated because it's less volume, right? So if you were to look at the EpiPen, uh, that would actually be the 1 to 1,000 concentration, or so 0.3 milligrams and 0.3 mLs. Because it's a whole lot easier to inject 0.3 mLs intramuscularly than 3 mLs, right? A lot less painful for your patient. Um, it depends on the product, but usually it'll be some sort of combination of preservatives and, and other things. It may not be saline specifically, but it usually will end up being some kind of isotonic mixture. Yeah. Um, so adverse reactions, certainly um, just having all these catecholamines going through your bloodstream, um, it's going to seem like you're really in the kind of a sympathomimetic kind of, kind of situation. So anxiety, hypertension, tachycardia can all occur, diaphoresis. Um, and the problems that come around when you mix up these concentrations and you give too much, um, you can lead to things like cerebrovascular hemorrhage, because you're having just so much clamping down in these blood vessels, MI, pulmonary edema, et cetera. So this is why it's really, really important not to screw this up and you make sure you're using the right concentrations. Does that make sense for everyone, those concentrations and whatnot? You already had a game for most providers out there in, in the ERs and stuff. You already know this. Okay, so other drugs we're going to be administering are going to be our histamine blockers. So again, when you're having these acute anaphylactic reactions, you have a ton of histamines being released. Um, main things we're going to be using are, the most bang for our buck is going to be from the H1 blockers. We talked a lot about those. Um, Usually you're going to be using first generation antihistamines. We're never going to really see second generation agents like, you know, cetirizine or things like that being administered uh, for anaphylaxis, but certainly diphenhydramine, hydroxazine, those both have readily available IV preparations that are going to be preferred. Um, they're going to help with the rash, the pruritus, the hives, all those really contagious effects are really going to be helped by these H1 blockers. Um, you can also use H2 blockers, which we haven't talked about GI stuff yet, but um, ranitidine is going to be kind of one a good example of an H2 blocker, and those are really helpful for blocking some of the GI effects that can occur. Um, it also helps to do uh, blunt some of the vasodilatation effects. So you may or may not see renitidine being given for someone in anaphylaxis, um, but if you see it, just know that there makes some sense because it's blocking a lot of gastric acid secretion in the stomach and things like that. Uh, you'll also be giving bronchodilators, uh, especially if you're having any kind of airway compromise. Um, these are nice because, you know, if you don't have IV access yet, you can give this, you know, one pretty easily just by nebulizer. But um, albuterol is going to be our go-to drug here. The beta-2 agonist so is going to help to relieve a lot of that bronchial smooth muscle uh, constriction that's happening there, kind of open up the airway a little bit. Um, certainly, you're going to see very similar side effects as what you would see with epinephrine. So, again, anxiousness, tremor, tachycardia can all happen here. And then the last group of drugs we'll be giving for anaphylaxis are mainly going to be our corticosteroids. So corticosteroids are very, very potent at blocking inflammation from occurring, but the one thing you need to note here is that it's going to take time. So really, um, even though you're administering all in kind of a big rush when they're having uh, you know, an acute anaphylactic reaction, know that your corticosteroids take time to work. And we know that they work in the intracellular receptors on the nucleus to change gene transcription and things like that. So that's why it takes so long. It takes hours before they really start to kick in. So you want to give them early, but just know that you know, your epinephrine, your albuterol, your antihistamines, those are really kind of kicking in first, whereas your corticosteroids are going to be kind of dealing with more of the, kind of the, the longer term effects of, of having the anaphylactic reaction. So um, main products you're going to be seeing used include things like methylprednisolone. Uh, it's very similar to prednisone, which I know we talked about previously, but it's the IV formulation. So you could give it IM, you could give it IV. Um, usually for more severe reactions, you're going to use a parenteral product like that versus for more kind of minor reactions, you might use oral um, steroids, things like prednisone, um, dexamethasone, things like that can be, should be appropriate uh, for this as well. Okay, so any questions on anaphylaxis? All right, moving on, uh, we'll start to talk about some of our heme drugs. Um, start off with iron chelators, kind of one of these miscellaneous hemat hematologic topics, but it's at least worth uh, noting.
uh, depending on who your patient population might be that you're working with. But essentially the body, um, the way it regulates iron in the body is that it, it doesn't really have a good mechanism to remove iron that's already been absorbed. Um, basically what it does though is it helps to regulate how much um, you absorb from the GI tract. So it can't eliminate iron directly, but it can uh, change how much is being absorbed from the GI tract. So um, a lot of it can be lost to intestinal mucosa. So you may lose one to two milligrams a day. Um, but in, there's some you know, disease states where you get a lot of transfusions and this can lead to chronic iron overload. So certainly things like sickle cell disease, aplastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, things like this um, can all be disease states where they need frequent uh, administration of, of transfused blood and they don't really have a good way to eliminate all that extra iron. So say for instance, you know, normal recommended daily allowance of iron, say eight, eight to 18 milligrams a day, these patients are gonna be receiving basically for every unit of blood around 250 milligrams of iron. So it's quite a bit extra uh, they don't necessarily need um, based on their nutritional status and things like that. Um, the problems though, problems of iron overload seen in more of a chronic state, um, you can see things like uh, cardiac uh, dilation, hypertrophy, you know, this could be over a 10 year period, you can see this. Uh, may be reversible in some cases, depending on how severe it is. Um, see pulmonary hypertension, insulin dependent diabetes, delayed puberty, thyroid dysfunction, all these problems that can occur chronic uh, or from chronic iron overload. So how do we get rid of extra iron? We are going to chelate it, which is basically just a fancy word of um, having a molecule that will come and grab it uh, and then allow it to be excreted usually through the kidneys. Okay, um, so we want to make sure that we're matching the amount of iron that's being transfused to the amount that's being chelated because we don't want to um, you know, accidentally take too much iron away and then now the patient has an iron deficiency, right? We don't want to do that. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we are going to be preventing a lot of this chronic morbidity and mortality from occurring in the first place. So a couple of different drugs we'll talk about here. The main ones to remember that you'll see uh, for clinical use include the deferoxamine, uh, DFO, and then you'll see uh, deferocerox or X-Jade. Um, you can kind of see in that picture in the middle there how the chelators will kind of come in. They kind of have these like claw-like structures and they come and grab onto the iron where at that point they become much more soluble and they can be excreted um, through the kidneys. So deferoxamine um, holds a special place for me, and at least as far as toxicology goes, because this is the one we use for acute iron overdoses. And it's used to be much more commonly used for more chronic iron um, overloads. Um, before we had some of our newer agents. Um, so this is one is gonna be a parenteral product only. And so it's really good for acute iron overdoses. So say someone um, takes too many uh, prenatal vitamins or something like that and you have an iron overdose, um, this would be the drug that you'd actually end up administering to help chelate that and get rid of it. Um, certainly some of the adverse effects you can see include things like hypotension and flushing. Uh, it's kind of interesting because certain bacteria actually like iron quite a bit and they grow uh, very well in the presence of iron. And so you can see the Yersinia colitis that can occur after administration of the drug after an acute iron overdose. Um, and you can also see things like pulmonary edema. Uh, the way we actually can tell that it's working in some cases is that it causes this vin rose urine, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, it kind of looks like a wine uh, almost. Um, don't want to drink that wine though, because it's, <laughs> it's urine. Um, so essentially what's happening is when the deferoxamine comes and binds to the iron, it forms this uh, desferioxamine complex, and that has the reddish color. So as you were to have iron overload, and I give uh, some of the chelator, um, as the higher the iron levels are, the more you're gonna see that reddish urine start to appear. And so before we could actually get um, accurate iron levels pretty reasonably, like nowadays you can get iron levels no problem, um, but say you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was not the case. Um, you'd actually give a test dose of this drug intramuscularly, and if you saw a change in their urine color, you would actually give you an idea that, okay, yes, they're having iron overload, Load, I need to give them more of this drug, right? And then as you saw the iron levels drop, you would eventually see the urine kind of turn back to, to a normal color. Um, so just know that that's a very common side effect. There's not any kind of hematuria or anything. It's just what uh, the drug does itself. Um, Deferoprone we don't really use too much because it has uh, issues with hepatic fibrosis and bony dysplasia. So this one does not get used. Just mention it for uh, completeness' sake. Uh, but the other one we are going to be using is this X-Jade. And this is a really kind of um, revolutionized things because it's a stable oral product that patients can use um, for uh, more chronic management of iron overload. And so it's a very cost-effective medication. They don't have to come into um, the hospital in order to get uh, administered, you know, things like defroxamine. Um, it does have some side effects, but they're pretty well tolerated in comparison uh, to some other medications. Mainly abdominal pain, GI discomfort is really going to be the big thing you see here. Maybe some headache, but pretty much well tolerated. Um, 
And so you may end up seeing that you have to adjust the dose based on how the patient tolerates it. So um, you'll be looking at things like iron levels, looking at their how much they can tolerate to kind of figure out right what the, the correct dose is for your patients. Okay. Uh, then moving on, uh, next we'll talk about uh, some of our antiplatelet agents, and this is where kind of get to all the anticoagulants, antiplatelets, and all that good stuff. So um, hemostasis, uh, have you guys covered anything about blood clotting and the clotting cascade and all that before? We're going to be seeing lots of that. I'm not going to make you draw it out or anything, but um, it's important to know the, the fundamentals of that uh, to understand this hemostasis and how our medications are going to be affecting that. So um, obviously blood should remain uh, fluid within the blood vessels, right? It's a pretty good starting point. Um, when you do have a vascular injury, though, it should like to clot off quickly. And then when you, uh, you know, if you have a thrombi occur, you should be able to establish fluidity, right? So we need to have kind of a carefully um, balanced system between clotting, just enough and then being able to get rid of those clots in order to prevent things from getting blocked off. So um, the things we'll see are the specific products that are affecting things like platelet aggregation, affecting um, thrombin formation and whatnot. We're going to see um, specific medications that are going to be affecting these different pathways and so it's important to understand kind of where they're coming into play here. Um, so for instance, if you were to have an injury to a blood vessel, um, you end up seeing initially this vasospasm to help limit actual blood leaking out of the vessel itself. You see things like um, uh, local media, like thromboxane. This will be an important place where things like um, aspirin are going to be working. Um, eventually, you're going to have this platelet plug that's going to form, and that's due to interactions with things like collagen and other mediators that are being uh, expressed on this kind of injured endothelial cells um, that the things like platelets can interact with. Um, next, you should end up seeing a fibrin clot. This is due to a lot of tissue factors. We'll talk about intrinsic and extrinsic factors um, or pathways. And then finally, once you have complete healing of the area, you should end up having fibrinolysis. And so this is mainly mediated by a product called plasmin. And you'll actually see that we have certain drugs that are, are able to um, enhance this activity of changing plasminogen over to plasmin so you can start to break up these fibrins. We'll talk more about that when we get to acute coronary syndromes. Mainly here, we're gonna talk about um, all the anticoagulants we were gonna be seeing used before that point. So um, you can see here that this is a very complicated process. Um, a lot of the drugs that we're gonna be seeing um, working are gonna be working either on the platelet inhibition. So we're gonna work on things like thromboxane. We're gonna look, look at uh, things like ADP um, to help prevent platelet aggregation. And then a lot of other medication you're gonna see being work, uh, working on the clotting cascade. So we're gonna see things that'll work um, on production of thrombin and also other um, activation of clotting factors uh, that hopefully will prevent a lot of fibrin from being made in the first place. And then finally, once you do have that fibrin being made, then you need something to come along and, and cleave that uh, to kind of uh, get rid of the, the plug that's happened. So we'll talk about those later, but mainly focus on kind of these upper pathways here. Um, so when you have these endothelial surfaces, especially if you have an injury that's occurring, um, you're going to have a lot of different products that are going to be interacting with things like platelets and whatnot to start this clotting cascade off. Um, so you end up seeing uh, a lot of these, um, in order to help prevent clotting from occurring in the first place, you certainly have some um, products that are kind of anticoagulant in nature. So for instance, uh, protein C is going to be a good anticoagulant because it helps inhibit factors 5 and 8. And that's going to be important when we talk about a medication like warfarin, um, whereas when you deplete protein C, you can actually end up having kind of a more pro-coagulant um, kind of situation, which can be problematic. Um, you also have antithrombin-3, which is going to be really, really important when we talk about our heparins, because um, they are useful for working to uh, inactivate products like thrombin, um, factor 10, and other things like that. And then your body actually produces heparin itself um, to some degree, um, which is going to be a product that helps the antithrombin to work better. So it actually um, helps the uh, the enzyme to work, you know, 100 to 1,000 times more quickly to inactivate a lot of things like factor 2, 12, 9, 10, things like that. Uh, things that are uh, also going to help with this, so uh, you can see prostacycline, which are going to be useful for inhibiting platelet activations, so things that are affecting prostacycline can either make things more likely to clot or not. Uh, thromboxane is going to be really important. We talk about aspirin, um, and then plasmin is going to be important for uh, de actually degrading fibrin that's already being produced. Um, Lots of other clotting kit factors that we'll talk about, uh, both pro and anticoagulant, but just know it's a complicated process, but we'll talk about drugs that are affecting specific um, steps along this pathway. So um, as you can see here, you can kind of see the platelets all aggregating together uh, along with the fibrin strands there. They help kind of um, adhere the whole plug uh, itself 
So um, specifically, we're going to talk about platelets first. Uh, and so the big thing you see here, so imagine the, the bottom here, you have your endothelial cells, or um, say you have a, a nick in the skin or something like that, or you have some kind of damage done to it. Um, initially, what's going to happen is you have certain products that are binding to things like von Willebrand's factor, and then that's going to interact with your platelets. Your platelets are then going to be activated through a couple steps we'll talk about. And then you see how they have this conformational change where they end up kind of shriveling up and you have these expression of these 2B3A receptors. Those are gonna be really important for cross-linking platelets. And so that's why the platelets make that plug initially is because you have that uh, 2B3A acceptor, uh, receptor expression. You're gonna have fibrinogen come along and help to bind uh, all those platelets together. And so that's where you get that initial plug from. So if we can do things to prevent either that actual conformational change, or if we can prevent those receptors from actually cross-binding, you prevent the platelets from really um, aggregating in the first place. That makes sense? Um, so again, the, the factors we're going to be seeing, the von Willebrand is going to bind to these glycoproteins that are on the endothelial cell layer. Um, when that binding occurs, that's when you're going to see things of, uh, release of things like thromboxane A2 and also ADP. It's a adenosine diphosphate. It's going to be important for uh, platelet activation as well. Um, so when those two interact with the, the platelets, that's when you see expression of the 2B3A receptors. Um, Again, fibrinogen is going to help make that cross-linking occur, so that's where you get that plug uh, that happens here. And then you'll also see the ADP is going to be activating these uh, P2Y1 uh, and P2Y12 receptors. So really we're kind of setting the stage for the different receptors and different um, components that our drugs are going to be affecting here. So this is why we're mentioning these all now, because they're going to come up again as we talk about the specific drugs. So um, this is a good slide to kind of exp uh, expressing all the different factors that will lead to platelet activation and aggregation. Um, first thing we'll probably end up talking about is going to be our aspirin, which is going to help to um, affect thromboxane A2 from being formed in the first place. Just a picture of the platelets before they're activated. See how they're kind of remain um, more, I guess, kind of spherical. And then when they get activated, it's when you see those 2B3A receptors kind of starting to poke out. Um, and so that's when you get the, those plugs happening. So um, in order to inhibit platelet activation, prostacyclin is going to be um, secreted by the endothelium. Um, so anything decreasing prostacyclin uh, production, things like NSAIDs can actually be affecting this. Um, also, you know, platelets are not expressing your 2B3A receptors, so that helps keep them from clotting in the first place. And you also have kind of low levels of expression of thrombin. So um, when you see things like the extrinsic or intrinsic pathways start to be activated, you see thrombin levels certainly rise, uh, but normally have kind of a low resting level when you have no kind of vascular injury um, that's present. Let's see. So now we'll talk about the, um, the actual uh, activation of the platelets. So aspirin will be the first one we talk about because obviously you see aspirin used quite a bit for its antiplatelet activity, right? So um, a lot of your patients who are on 81 milligrams a day, chances are they're using it for specifically this reason. So um, we remember that the main difference between your other NSAIDs, your other non-steroidal drugs, and aspirin is, is what? Suicide. It's a suicide inhibitor, right? So um, what does that mean, it's a suicide inhibitor? Yeah, so once it binds to the platelets, irreversibly bound to that, which means for the life of that platelet, it's stuck there, right? And the life cycle of a platelet's like what? That's like 120 days or something? No, red cell is 120, platelet's 7 to 10. 7 to 10. That works for me. Anywho, <laughs> not so important, but for the life cycle of that entire platelet, it is being bound up by the aspirin. See, I'm fallible. I don't know everything. Um, so essentially what we're going to be seeing here, oh, see, right there on the slide, 7 to 10 days, you're right. <laughs> should probably read my own slides before I uh, talk about them. Anywho, um, I'll edit that out. Uh, <laughs> so basically what we're seeing here is that the aspirin is going to be working to uh, irreversibly inhibit that cyclooxygenase enzyme or COX enzyme. You remember if it affects one or two? You're right, it affects both, right? Because it's non-selective uh, for cyclooxygenase. But that's going to be important because we know that one of them is going to be inducible and one of them is going to be more constitutive, right? So when we're having like an inflammatory pathway uh, activating, uh, you see that COX-2 becoming more important because that's the inducible cyclooxygenase versus COX-1 <laughs> being much more constitutive. It's kind of being expressed all the time. Um, so by having the aspirin come along, it's going to be inhibiting the production of thromboxane which is going to inhibit the platelets from activating in the first place. We saw that when you had that vascular injury, thromboxane was important for leading to platelet activation. So, um, and then when you get to higher doses, not usually seen at the, and we'll talk about why we use the lower doses that we do, um, but at higher doses, you can end up seeing prostacyclin being inhibited, and that can actually lead to more of a kind of pro 
um, platelet activation kind of kind of setting. So you want to have prostacycline around because it's an antiplatelet aggregator, but you want to inhibit that thromboxane, right? So it's kind of the delicate balance between the two. So when you have lower doses being used, say lower than you would see used for things like headache or you know sprained ankle, um, you know, say 160 milligrams or less, you are giving enough drug in order to help uh, kind of hit all of your platelets. To irreversibly inhibit them, um, but you're not giving so much, you're inhibiting prostacycline production, right? So that's why we give the doses that we do. Usually 81 milligrams is enough to, um, if you take it consistently every day, all of your platelets should be getting affected uh, for the most part. So again, just kind of give you an idea of how the cyclooxygenase is uh, being utilized to help convert that arachidonic acid over into lots of different prostaglandins, thromboxanes, uh, prostacyclins, all that good stuff. Um, we remember the prostaglandin effects, obviously, because we talked a lot about it, their effects on hypertension and things like that. But really, for, for these purposes, for platelet activation, thromboxane and prostacycline are the two we're going to focus on for this. So again, this is going to be uh, a non-selective inhibitor of cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. Um, so obviously, COX-2 is going to be more expressed in those endothelial cells expressing inflammation. So when you're having you know, vascular injury, these, these are the ones that are going to be, um, you're going to see a higher concentration of COX-2 at those sites. Um, and so again, uh, this is why we can't use drugs that are specifically COX-2 inhibitors um, because they would actually not really have any effect on thromboxane. They'd really only block the effects of prostacyclin. So that would actually be bad for us from a clotting perspective. So this is why we want to use non-selective inhibitors uh, for this purposes. So we don't use NSAIDs for cardio protection for these patients, and the reason is that they are reversible inhibitors, right? So even though you do get some antiplatelet effect from your other NSAIDs, it's not really to such a degree um, and not to such a, a long-term kind of effect that we get a whole lot of therapeutic use out of it. So aspirin is really the only one we're going to use for this case. Um, so if you look at something like ibuprofen, you may only get some antiplatelet activity for 24 hours, but not really to the same degree as you do with aspirin because it's that suicide inhibitor for all of your platelets, right? Um, so this is why we mainly just use aspirin aspirin. Obviously we know some of our, uh, our side effects are going to be um, related to that inhibition of cyclooxygenase, so certainly uh, things like peptic ulcer disease, worsening of GERD, things like that, because we do know that the cyclooxygenase enzymes are really important for gastric protection, right? So COX-1 is really important for that as a constitutive enzyme for producing a lot of the, the protective layers on the, on the stomach, you know, that uh, mucosal barrier to help prevent the acids from actually eating away. Um, and then also bleeding is going to be a, a, obviously the common side effect. And really with any of these drugs we're going to talk about, bleeding is going to be a side effect, right? So it's just obviously anytime you're monkeying with the uh, clotting cascade, you know, bleeding is going to be a risk. Um, some other kind of miscellaneous blockers of uh, platelets you might see. So dipyridamol is one you don't see used all that too often. Um, it works as both a vasodilator, uh, but it also does things like inhibit, um, it actually increases levels of cyclic AMP, which actually helps to decrease platelet activation. Um, inhibits adenosine uptakes, so you have decreased ADP production. So it works all, uh, by a couple different mechanisms, um, but it doesn't get used all that too much clinically just because of the fact that there's not a ton of data supporting its use over other drugs. Um, so the place you'll probably see it used most often is going to be for patients who have had ischemic stroke or transient ischemic attacks because one, it helps prevent um, platelet activation, but also has that vasodilator effect, which may be somewhat protective for those patients. Um, and sometimes you'll see it used in combination with uh, aspirin, and you have the drug called Agronox. So that's that combination of dipyridamol plus aspirin. Um, again, not something you see used uh, super frequently, but if you ever do see it, that's what it is. All right, so then moving on, we'll talk about our next group of drugs that are gonna inhibit the platelet activation. Uh, next ones we'll talk about are going to be our ADP receptor blockers. And so by inhibiting the actions of adenosine diphosphate, um, you're going to help prevent the activation of these two receptors, it's P2Y1 and it's P2Y12. And both of them are important for activating platelets. The Y1 receptor um, is responsible somewhat for inducing shape change and aggregation of platelets. And then um, the P2Y12 is important for um, actually inhibits production of cyclic AMP which will lead to further platelet activation. So as cyclic AMP levels decrease, you see more platelet activation occurring. So to, in order to fully inhibit a platelet from being activated, you really have to hit both receptors. But we'll end up seeing that most of our drugs are gonna be more preferential for that P2Y12 receptor. So you get kind of more of a, just a limited platelet activation. Um, you can also see some direct inhibition of uh, fibrinogen uh, for binding that 2B38 receptor together, but really sees ADP receptors are the big um, focuses for these drugs. Um, so the four that we'll talk about for this category, including uh, ticlopidine, clopidogrel, 
which is known as Plavix, which is a pretty common one, um, Ticagrelor, Tyca and then Prasugrel are gonna be the four ADP receptor blockers. They're kind of, kind of a mouthful uh, to say. Um, so these guys are really, really important because they have kind of revolutionized the ability to um, allow for things like stent placements within the heart uh, that will prevent clots from forming on those stents, right? Um, so anytime you're putting foreign material into a blood vessel, it tends to want to clot off, right? So by putting this bare metal stents or a drug eluting stent into a coronary vessel and by giving antiplatelet agents, you can prevent them from clotting off and keep um, that artery open. Okay. So this is why these drugs are so important. They've kind of revolutionized that. So a lot of patients who are post PCI, you'll end up seeing them on things like aspirin and Plavix, or they'll be on this uh, Berlinta or things like that. So, um, Usually what you end up seeing is that they have kind of delayed maximal effects. So in order to help bypass that somewhat, you give loading doses to help get the drug up to steady state a little bit quicker. So most of the drugs you'll end up seeing having a loading dose prior to uh, their maintenance dosing. So especially when they're um, you know, post PCI, they may get a loading dose of it um, for that. Um, other things you can see used for include things like prevention of stroke, prevention of MI, peripheral artery disease. Um, these are also useful if your patient cannot tolerate aspirin, they have an allergy or something like that, you can get away with using one of these drugs as an alternative. So uh, teclopidine is probably the, one of the first ones. You'll see many of these are pro-drugs that require uh, hepatic activation for them to actually work. Um, you'll see that teclopidine probably isn't used all that too frequently due to side effects. A lot of the other drugs have kind of supplanted it um, because they're more tolerable for the most part or just more effective. So say for instance, you look at things like, you know, the risk for thrombotic thrombocytopenic uh, purpura, TTP, it's a very potentially a serious side effect. Um, you'll see that the risk of that, um, you know, if it does occur, mortality can be very high in some cases if it's not treated appropriately. Um, but, you know, the, a lot of the other drugs we'll see have much less risk of that. So you won't, that's why the, the other ones are much more frequently. Uh, so things like clopidogrel is probably one of the big go-to drugs um, for a while. Again, another pro drug. It's binding to that P2Y12 receptor. Um, and again, you'll see that these drugs have synergistic a uh, actions with aspirin to help prevent um, initial activation of those platelets in the first place, right? So you have aspirin working on the thromboxane route, and you have these guys working on the ADP um, receptor um, activation. So through both ways, um, you know, when you saw when you had that vascular injury occur, you saw both of those products being released to help activate those platelets, and we're blocking both of those now. Um, you see here the TTP risk is much, much lower um, with clopidogrel than we saw with teclopidine. So again, another good reason why we're going to use this one. Um, and certainly bleeding risk is still going to be a, a possibility, but it's fairly low for the most part. Uh, we'll also see prasugrel, which is again another pro-drug. Um, you actually end up seeing in some of the, the literature now that prasugrel probably has um, a little bit better platelet inhibition as opposed to something like clopidogrel. Um, and so you end up seeing um, certainly a higher bleeding risk to some degree, but there may be some extra clinical benefit to that as well. Um, so prasugrel would be another one. And then the final one um, would be ticrac. Ticagrelor, sorry, it's still hard to say, Brylenta. Now uh, this one's not actually a pro-drug, uh, but it does have some active metabolites. So once the, the parent drug, even though it's active, gets metabolized, there's still uh, an active um, secondary metabolite that can be uh, useful for an antiplatelet activity. Um, this one actually saw um, had some data in, in some of the preclinical trials that actually show better mortality benefits over clopidogrel. So this might actually be one of your um, bigger go-to drugs. But you'll see it really depends on kind of what hospital you're working at, what their formulary is, what their go-to drug is going to be. Um, so like in my case, when I have a lot of um, we have cardiac kids coming into Nemours, mainly see clopidogrel being kind of the go-to that they were using, right? So it really just depends on on who you're working with and what their formulary is. Okay. Uh, so then moving on uh, to the next step for platelet inhibition, we're talking about our 2B3A receptor blockers, right? So these are blocking the actual, uh, even though your platelets may have been activated, they may have had that conformational change, this is preventing that kind of um, cross-linking from occurring between your different platelets, right? Um, so in abcixumab is gonna be the first one we'll talk about, and this is notable because this is probably the first monoclonal antibody we've talked about. So I mentioned monoclonal antibodies before. Okay, so these are a good group of drugs. Um, they kind of set themselves apart because they're protein-based. And essentially what they are is they are proteins that have been, um, they're antibodies, as the name would imply, a monoclonal antibody um, that's been targeted against a specific um, either uh, antibody or specific receptor as a specific target that it's been made against. Um, a lot of these like um, uh, 
things like you know uh, snake antivenom and things like that are uh, sheet based. Um, some of these are going to be more synthetically made. Um, just depends on on the products and how they're they're actually made. Um, but anytime you see a MAB at the end of one of these drugs, that means it's a monoclonal antibody. So that's going to carry with it some potential risks and some other caveats to their use. Um, one thing is anytime you're injecting foreign proteins into a person, what do you run the risk of? Yeah, sensitization, allergic reactions can be a big thing, right? So you'll see a lot of monoclonal antibodies being used for like rheumatologic drugs or any other kind of like autoimmune uh, disorder. So a lot of like, you know, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis drugs, things like that. You'll see a lot of drugs there and that's always gonna be a risk. It's gonna be um, hypersensitivity uh, to those products, especially with repeated uses. Um, the other thing is that these protein products are much, much more expensive to make than a lot of other drugs. And so they are typically very, very expensive. So just keep that in mind. Now, the ADP receptor blockers or uh, oral products, you're going to see those being used for more chronic management uh, of those patients as, as antiplatelet activity um, goes. But with the 2B3A receptors, these are going to be um, IV short acting agents that are going to be administered um, for specific cases. So if you have a person who has an MI um, or they say they have, you know, um, like a non-SD elevated MI, they're going for PCI or something like that. Like these are some drugs they're going to get started on to help have kind of immediate effects to help block those platelets from from cross-linking to forming bigger plugs, right? Um, you can see here, like the infusion, it's only half an hour long, so this would be one of those drugs given by continuous fusion infusion versus giving you know say um, you know maintenance doses say every day or something like that. Um, so angioplasty would probably be a big one, especially with, in combination with other drugs like heparin and aspirin um, to help prevent restenosis. Obviously, bleeding is going to be a big risk here. Uh, anytime you're preventing those platelets from, from clotting together to form those plugs, bleed is going to be a possibility. Um, and then again, always a concern about hypersensitivity, especially with repeated use. Um, we have eptifibatide, which is not a monoclonal antibody, so you probably wouldn't have the same hypersensitivity risk. That could be one benefit to this drug over the other ones. Um, Again, very similar activity, very similar use case. A lot of this is all going to get depend on the formulary of the hospital that you're at as opposed to what drug they prefer. You have tipofotide or integralin, and then you have tyrofibrin or agrostat <laughs> uh, being the third agent we see here. Um, again, non-peptide based, so less immunogenic risk. So, you know, if a test question came up, you know, say which drug would a patient most likely have an allergic reaction to upon repeated administration, you probably want to say monoclonal antibody or abziximab, right? So something could come up. You never know. Okay. So that would be all of our platelet blocking agents. Kind of makes sense as far as like how the mechanism goes, how they're working at different steps in the process. Uh, as far as, you know, when the platelets are either already activated or they're preventing activation. So kind of keep that straight in your head. Uh, and then moving on, we will talk about the anticoagulants. Uh, I'll probably give you guys a 10 minute break now and then we'll come back and uh, get through as much of this as we can. Okay, getting back to our anticoagulants as everyone shuffles in. Uh, they're just so excited to continue on with our talks of bleeding and whatnot. Um, so anyway, so the next drugs we're going to look at are be uh, affecting directly our coagulation cascade. So certainly you guys know that there's an intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. Uh, the extrinsic pathway usually gets activated when what happens? Yeah, it was like, there's like some sort of injury. That, that's how I kind of think about it. There's actually tissue factor that's being released from the endothelial cells, usually with some sort of injury uh, or some kind of breaking the barrier. That's when you think extrinsic factor gets activated. And then you have your intrinsic factor um, for kind of everything else. Uh, the nice thing, at least with the drugs we're going to talk about, is that you really don't need to differentiate between which system you're, you're, you're dealing with. Um, but you do want to kind of key on some of the more important factors that our drugs are going to be working against. So we'll see certain drugs that are going to prevent the formation of clotting factors. We're going to be some drugs that will lead to enhanced inhibition or uh, in enhanced inactivation of the factors in order to help uh, stop this whole process from occurring. And notice it's kind of a cyclical kind of thing. So you can have a cascade effect that it can occur by activation of things like thrombin 2A going back and, and activating further uh, of the you know, intrinsic pathway and things like that. So once you kind of inactivate certain factors, you can kind of inhibit a lot of that cascading process that it can occur. So even though some drugs might be very specific for say factor 10, they can still be very potent in blocking this whole clotting cascade. Does that make sense? So the two ones that you'll see a lot of drugs inhibiting uh, specifically are gonna be 10 and two. Um, so think about when you're driving down the road, 10 and two. Um, those are two very important factors that we'll talk about with some of our anticoagulants.
So you can see here where certain drugs are going to be um, working. So we'll talk about some that make antithrombin 3 work a little bit better. So you'll see things like 11, 9, uh, 2, 10, 11, 12, things like that being affected. Um, Protein C and S are going to be important because protein C is actually an anticoagulant uh, and that will actually be affected by a drug like warfarin. We'll talk about the clinical um, uh, importance of that, that is. Um, but just be aware that there are certain uh, natural anticoagulants uh, that your body is already producing in order to help kind of inhibit this process in order to help keep that, that nice balance between uh, too much clotting and, and too little clotting. Uh, the first group we'll talk about is going to be our heparins, and we already kind of mentioned this because this is something your body actually makes uh, itself. Uh, it's a very long molecule, it's a kind of a long sugar-based um, molecule that you'll have. It can uh, range um, in size by quite a bit, so you'll have different size chains of heparin that are being produced. Um, you can see the molecular weight here going anywhere between 3,000 to 30,000 uh, Daltons, um, usually averaging somewhere between 12 and 15. We'll talk about different drugs that are actually shorter than that and how that affects the activity of the drug itself. Um, we should be aware this is something that we produce ourselves. It's you know it's a biologically based um, kind of product. So when we say unfractionated heparin, we're talking just talking about regular old heparin, right? So this is a product that is by itself has not been really modified from the base biological pro uh, product that you would make yourself. Uh, does anyone know where a lot of heparin actually comes from? I guess um, where we get a lot of our exogenous heparin. What kind of animal? Yeah, it's like porcine uh, intestine uh, is where we uh, get some. Some of them you'll see from like Chinese hamster ovary cells. Uh, they're being produced. It's oddly specific, I know, but that's why it sticks out in my head. Um, that will not be a uh, quiz question. That would be an easy one to remember, right? So. Uh, that, that will not be a test question, but um, essentially what we're going to end up seeing is that once the heparin is being administered or it's being produced by us, it works uh, as a suicide substrate, uh, uh, it works along with antithrombin-3. So antithrombin-3 goes and it activates the following factors. Uh, notice that I said 2 and 10 are very important, so these are the two biggest ones that are going to be affected by antithrombin-3, but you also have 9, 11, and 12 being affected here. Um, I'm probably not, as far as testing goes, getting really in depth on which factors that are being inhibited by which drug. So, well, I will for certain uh, factors, but you don't have to know this whole entire list, um, but just realize that two and 10 are very, very important for this process. The other ones are just kind of some bonus. Do you have them listed out like that because it's a cascade, so if you stop 2A, then it stops all the rest of them from it, Exactly, because two is kind of like the, that final factor that really gotcha. um, did a lot with uh, in activating fibrin, right? Um, so again, there's a good point to, to mention there that two is really important um, because it's actually the one that leads to the activation of fibrin. Um, so after your platelets are aggravated, ag aggregated and clotted together, um, the fibrin really kind of holds the whole thing together. Um, so by inhibiting two, you inhibit a lot of that fibrin from being produced in the first place. So once the clotting factors are activated, antithrombin three is going to come on and inactivate them. Heparin makes this process much more quick and much more efficient. So, like I said, it increases activity something like a thousand-fold uh, when this occurs. Um, and we'll look at the different clotting factors and their sizes and how this is going to be affected by the size of the heparin that we're going to use um, when we're treating these guys. So I think this is kind of a good picture um, that demonstrates the, the thing here. So unfractionated heparin, if you think about it as being this kind of big, long, sugary chain, um, how it's working. You see antithrombin-3 there, it's being a necessary cofactor. Uh, and then you look at factor like 10A, and then you have 2A. Notice that 2A is much longer, and so it requires a longer heparin molecule to inactivate it. So that'll be important when we talk about our low molecular weight heparins. But basically, you'll see unfractionated heparin come along, and it's able to bind the antithrombin-3 and the factor 2A and inactivate it, and it can do the same thing with 10A as well. Again, you said porcine intestinal mucosa, bovine lung might be another source you can get it from. Um, now this drug is not absorbed from the GI tract, so this is only going to be administered uh, parenterally. So you can see it being given IV, sub-Q very frequently. Um, you have more immediate onset when given IV. So if I give you a big bolus of heparin IV, you're going to get kind of immediate anticoagulant effect as it helps enhance the activity of that antithrombin-3. And then if I were to give it, say, sub-Q for more, say, prophylactic purposes uh, from preventing clots, you'll see a more delayed onset of action as the drug gets absorbed from that sub-Q space, right? Uh, it's important to note here that uh, heparin itself does not cross the placenta or the blood-brain barrier. It's not found in breast milk. So actually for pregnant patients who are worried about being kind of in a more pro-coagulant kind of state, you're worried about clots forming, this is the drug to go to, right?
the heparin is going to be good for that. You don't want to use uh, a drug like warfarin, which is also an anticoagulant, because that actually leads to a lot of very serious fetal effects um, as compared to something like heparin that doesn't really cross over. Um, you will see that you will have may have some uh, changes in uh, half-life to some small degree for patients who have, say, maybe cirrhosis or renal failure. But for the most part, you don't really need to do a lot of uh, adjustment as far as the dose goes in, in regards to, to organ impairment. The reason for that is the way that we're actually going to be monitoring um, these patients for anticoagulant effect. Uh, it's important to note for patients that have like renal failure, this is going to be the preferred drug to go to as well. Because some of our low molecular weight drugs and some of our other drugs are not going to be preferred due to the fact they don't get cleared so quickly. So the way we monitor, and so it's important to remember how we monitor for activity for these drugs, because it's going to be different between different drugs, and you want to make sure you're ordering the right assays to look for your anticoagulant effect. So the first thing we're going to be seeing with heparin is going to be our APTT, which is our activated partial thromboplastin time. Again, normally you're going to be looking at kind of ratios here, so um, a typical therapeutic ratio. Uh, for uh, APTT with heparin, someone who's on a heparin drip, say for an already existing clot, so say they have a pulmonary embolus or say they have an MI, um, you typically going to be shooting per se one and a half to two and a half times, right? What a, the normal APTT would be. And so what you end up normally seeing um, in most hospitals that they have nomograms where it actually will tell you, okay, for this patient you're going to bolus with this many um, units per kilogram. And again, heparin's usually uh, dosed in units not going to be in, in milligrams like you would typically see. So this one you're going to dose in units and say, you know, 50 units per kilogram as a bolus. And then you start your infusion as say how many ever, you know, units per hour. So say 20 units per kilogram per hour. And then you'll draw your APTT a certain period of time later. And then depending on what that APTT is, you're going to adjust your dose. So you say if it's too high, you're obviously going to adjust your dose down. If it's too low, then you adjust your dose up. Otherwise, you just leave it the same, right? So you're kind of doing a therapeutic drug monitoring kind of program with this um, by measuring your APTTs in a serial fashion to make sure you're getting the appropriate anticoagulant effect. Make sense? So every hospital is going to be a little different. You'll see the dosing guidelines will be different. Um, but you'll have be able to follow that in order to help know how to how to manage your patient. Be, it kind of makes it a little bit easier to use. Um, usually, when you're doing it um, for more prophylactic purposes, so say like you had a patient in the ICU um, who's bedridden, uh, you're worried about DVTs forming, um, you'd be given this a sub Q every you know uh, every eight hours or so. You don't need to necessarily monitor for that because you're really just making sure they're not prevent uh, having a clot form. So you don't do routine monitoring for that, right? But typical indications if you either prof uh, prophylaxis for uh, clots forming or for an already established clot like venous thromboembolism, pulmonary embolism, um, coronary angioplasty, any of these reasons, uh, you can give heparin to help prevent a clot from, uh, from occurring. In some cases you might see really big doses of heparin being used in like special circumstances. So like um, say like over at Nemours again, we had our cardiac program start up. Um, whenever you have a patient going on car um, uh, cardiac bypass, like that requires huge doses of heparin um, in order to help make sure the blood doesn't actually clot off in uh, the machine itself, right? Because anytime you're exposing blood to you know foreign material, it wants to clot, and so you use a lot, a lot of uh, heparin in order to prevent those, those uh, circuits from clotting off. So obviously bleeding is going to be the major um, uh, toxicity we're going to see with this. Uh, reversal agents will be another big thing you want to focus on with the anticoagulants because again, with bleeding being such a big problem, especially if you're bleeding into your head and, or bleeding in other really bad places, um, you want to be able to reverse this stuff. And so knowing what drug reverses what is going to be important as well. So for instance here, whenever we have someone who has heparin toxicity, we're going to get protamine uh, to be the reversal agent. So you'll have uh, dosing nomograms as well that'll say like how much protamine you're going to be giving. Um, but basically what it does, it helps to bind up the, pro, uh, the heparin in order for it to be eliminated without it um, continuing to be active, right? So the reversal agent for heparin is going to be protamine sulfate. Does anyone know where protamine sulfate comes from? Salmon sperm. Weird. <laughs> like I said, I have no idea where these, uh, you know, these scientists are coming up with ideas of, of uh, getting some of these products, but that's where it comes from. Um, if you ever have someone who has an allergy to protamine, um, uh, they probably also have an allergy to certain insulin products. So that's that one where, you know, if it's someone says they have an uh, allergy to insulin, that doesn't really make sense because, you know, everyone produces insulin, right? So type 1 diabetics. But, um, but essentially, you know, most of them are going to be uh, uh, having a reaction to certain products uh, like NPH insulin. Those actually contain protamine to help extend the half-life of it, but that's usually what people end up having an allergy to. We'll talk more about that in the endocrinology section. Um, 
So then uh, the other big uh, side effect you worry about with heparin is going to be this heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. It's relatively rare, but when it happens, it can be very devastating uh, if you don't catch it in time. And so this is basically a, an immune reaction. And what's happening is you have this product called platelet factor 4 that will form a complex with heparin uh, that your body will generate an antibody against. Okay, so when that happens, it can end up causing um, a big, uh, it basically causes a lot of your platelets to start activating, to start clotting off, which leads to a thrombocytopenia. So even though it looks like they're thrombocytopenic, they're actually in a procoagulant state, right? Um, so it can lead off to clots, can lead to things like, um, you know, limb amputations due to gangrene forming uh, from blocking off certain vessels. It can lead to new embolus uh, forming, all kinds of bad stuff. So you definitely want to catch it when it, when it occurs. Um, doesn't occur automatically. It usually takes around five to 10 days for it to start to really pop up. And what you're gonna end up seeing is when you're looking at your CBCs, you're gonna see a big drop off in their platelets, usually like 50% or more, um, you end up seeing that. And then when you do have that happen, obviously you wanna stop your heparin immediately. And then the way you want to help prevent those new clots from forming is by giving um, some other drugs, some uh, d actual direct thrombin inhibitors. And so we'll talk about these more in a little bit later, but this includes leporudin, argatriban, and as denaparoid. Um, so those are some drugs we'll, we'll talk about later on, um, but they are alternative anticoagulants that we can use um, to help prevent all those platelets from, from forming new clots. So, um, and in general, when we talk about our low molecular weight heparins, someone who's had HIT, you do not want to give them a low molecular weight heparin because there is a cross-reactivity risk that they could have a new development of HIT again, right? So if you have someone who has HIT, you never want to give them heparin again for the duration of their life because they they're going to have that same antibody forming uh, once again, right? We also, um, in order to test for HIT, we actually do have some antibody assays that you can actually measure for. Um, so it'd be one of those things where if you actually suspect HIT, um, you know, obviously get them off the heparin, put them on one of these um, alternative agents, and then you would actually send off uh, a sample. Um, you know, the last place I worked, we didn't do it in-house, they'd send off the Mayo or somewhere, um, where they would actually do a test for the, the HIT antibodies, and that would actually give you a positive confirmation they had HIT or not. And that would definitely be listed as an allergy for them from, from then on. Uh, so then we have our low molecular weight heparins. So these would be our fractionated heparins. Um, and so basically these are the same molecules as heparin, but they're just chopped up a little bit shorter, right? Um, so, you know, we, normally we saw anywhere uh, seeing up to like 15,000 Daltons as being, you know, kind of a, an average for heparin. You see these being much shorter. So say like the average here being around 5,000, okay? Um, so these can either be uh, formed a couple different ways, uh, either enzymatically or chemically, uh, but basically they're just gonna be fragments of, of normal unfractionated heparin. Um, the three big ones you're gonna see are gonna be anoxaparin, daltaparin, and tenzaparin. Um, clinically, I've only ever seen anoxaparin being used. I think most hospitals probably uh, lean towards using this, um, either due to just use or cost or whatever it happens to be, but th this is probably one of the big go-to um, low molecular weight heparins we'll see being used. Um, I put not equivalent on there because you'll actually see that their dosing is going to change depending on what you're looking at. Some are dosed in units, some are going to be dosed in milligrams, and so um, it's important to look at your dosing guidelines because it's not going to be the same uh, depending on the low molecular weight heparin you're looking at because how they get derived will change what their activity actually is. Right? Does that make sense? Because you know, the way they're chopping up the, the heparin molecule can be a little bit different. Um, so the big change that you're seeing here is that because they're shorter, they have a harder time inactivating thrombin or uh, factor 2A. And so because of that, they actually have much more uh, preferential activity against factor 10. And so that's where you're going to see a lot of our uh, monitoring is actually going to be a little bit different. Um, so again, looking at the ratios of it, unfractionated heparin, say, is 1 to 1 between factor 2A and 10A, whereas with your low molecular weight heparin, it's probably closer to 2 to 4 times more active against 10A than it is for 2A. Okay. Show you a picture of that in just a second. It'll make that it'll make a little more sense. So if you look here, being a shorter molecule than your normal unfractionated heparin, um, you see it's just uh, a lot of them. A lot of the molecules just aren't long enough. Some are, but most are not long enough to actually inactivate that factor 2A as well as unfractionated heparin would. So that's why it does much better with 10A because it's just a shorter molecule um, that can help the antithrombin 3 to inactivate. Does that make sense? So um, there's some benefits uh, to using low molecular weight heparins over a heparin. Um, 
usually you'll see with these agents that you don't need to do a lot of monitoring. So whereas with um, heparin, you had to do a lot of monitoring of APTT, especially if you're using it um, therapeutically. And so when I talk about clot prevention versus um, uh, actual clots already formed, um, you know, there's prophylactic use and there's actual therapeutic use. And so therapeutic use is like you have a, an established clot and I'm trying to help get rid of it or prevent it from getting any worse versus prophylactic, it means I don't I'll have a clot yet, right? So for these guys, um, you have basic just weight-based dosing. It's very easy to, to dose it for your patients. Um, you will see that there's much more renal elimination of these drugs, so you do need to make sure that your patients, um, you're adjusting the dose based on renal dysfunction. Um, so if I have a patient who has a low enough renal um, uh, function, I may change from dosing my noxaparin twice a day just to once a day, because they're not clearing the drug quite so quickly, and they're, they're getting more activity out of the drug. Um, note here that if I were to draw an APTT, because these drugs don't affect uh, factor 2A as well as an unfractionated heparin was, I'm not really going to be using this as a reliable indicator of anticoagulant effect. Okay, And so because of that, you also don't need a lot of routine monitoring. So if I were to give this to, say, an uh, otherwise healthy post-operative surgical patient, um, I can just give them you know, an oxaparin twice a day or once a day, you know, depending on how I'm dosing it, um, and they're good to go. I don't have to do any more monitoring. So that's what, that was one of the big benefits of using low molecular weight heparins over heparin um, because you didn't need to monitor things like APTT. Now, that doesn't work for all patients because you will find some who have altered pharmacokinetics. So especially very obese patients, um, especially in small children, you want to get a better idea of what actual anticoagulant effect they're having because, again, if I have too much effect, I worry about bleeding. If I didn't have not enough effect, I worry about clots forming, right? So in which case, I'd actually be measuring an anti-factor 10A assay. And so this is the assay that I'm going to run that will tell me how well I am, how much anticoagulant effect I'm getting from my low molecular weight heparins, OK? So if like a test question came up and it said, you know, you give anoxaparin uh, for prevention, or, you know, for treatment of uh, pulmonary embolus um, in, say, a child, um, what would you use to measure the anticoagulant effect? You know, APTT, INR, antifactor 10A, something else, you know, calcium. Um, you would know to pick antifactor 10A for anoxaparin, right? Based on, uh, on the drug and the activity it's having. So, um, like say for instance, if you're on like a typical like you know adult med surge floor, you probably wouldn't be ordering very many of these. And say something like you know the ICU, or if I had like you know if say a five six hundred pound patient, or if I was in the peds ICU, um, I would be measuring antifactor ten A's much more frequently in order to make sure I'm not underdosing or overdosing the patients. Um, and again, you'll have kind of um, you'll end up seeing uh, dosing recommendations based on what the antifactor ten A comes at, um, as far as you know how to adjust your dose uh, one way or the other. Um, obviously, toxicity, uh, again, bleeding is going to be the big thing here. Usually, less bleeding risk than with heparin, which is another benefit, um, but you may still have some hit um, uh, chance for developing heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. It's less than with heparin, but it's still a possibility with these guys because they are still long enough to form that complex with um, uh, that platelet factor four and get those antibodies being formed. Uh, another drug, which is even a uh, shorter variety of low molecular weight heparin, is going to be Fonda Paranox or Erixtra. Uh, and so this one is a very, very short, just a pentasaccharide. Um, uh, the actual kind of the business end of the molecule is actually interacting with antithrombin anti 3. And so this one actually has no factor 2A activity, only factor 10A. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on with that sound, but I'm just going to continue on as if I wasn't hearing it. Um, something comes crashing down, we'll, we'll know. Um, so anyway, so again, this, this drug is going to have specifically only factor 10A activity, no 2A activity. Okay, so this is what differentiates this drug from, from the other ones. So if I were to ask you how you would monitor this, if you wanted to monitor the, the effects, how would you monitor it? Anti-factor 10A, right? Because it's only affecting uh, factor 10A. And the interesting thing is, um, you know, my wife, she's a pharmacist as well. She's over at the VA. Um, one of the things we're actually starting to see now is that um, they're getting some better data to show that anti-factor 10A might be a better indicator of um, anticoagulant effect with heparin itself. And so a lot of their um, patients are moving over to monitoring anti-factor 10A instead of um, APTT. So in your lifespan, uh, in, your, in your career, you might actually see that trend more towards using this. Um, for a while, it was very difficult to get the assay done. You had to do a send out uh, to get it, but now more and more places are doing it in-house. Um, so just be aware that might happen, but for our purposes, APTT is still gonna be for heparin, anti-factor 10A is gonna be for these other uh, medications. Um, 
Nice thing about Erixor has a lot longer half-life, so again, you can give it once a day. Um, but do not use it in renal failure. Be contraindicated in those patients, because again, they can't clear it very well. Um, and this would actually have the lowest incidence of HIT. And so clinically, someone who has a history of HIT with heparin, um, you could get away with using a Rix drug, okay? So if a test question was saying, you know, a uh, patient has a history of HIT, which of these drugs would be safe for them to use? Uh, a Rix drug would be one of those ones. An oxaparin would not, right? Because it's still it's long enough, they can still have some cross activity there. Um, usually you're going to end up seeing this in, uh, mostly in like, you know, post-op ortho patients, so say knee, hip replacement, things like that, uh, we're going to see it most often used. Again, these uh, heparin products are all going to be parenteral, so no oral administration of these drugs because they don't get absorbed very well. So Rixtra, you know, your noxaparins, your heparins, all are going to be um, usually the sub-Q or IV. Okay, uh, the next group we'll talk about are going to be our direct thrombin inhibitor. So instead of having any factor 10A activity, they're specifically going to be working as factor 2A, right? Um, these ones we'll talk about right now are going to be uh, parental products, but we'll talk about some a little bit later. They'll actually be uh, an oral product uh, that's a newer, uh, newer agent. So direct thrombin inhibitors, uh, they're actually based on the product Hiridin, which is the anticoagulant that's made in leeches. So if you ever see um, leeches being used in the hospital, it's um, kind of a big mess because they like to escape from their tank and kind of a big problem. They're, they're kind of expensive, but nowadays we have these products we can use for the most part. So you don't see leeches being used all too frequently anymore. Um, that's actually true. They, they're really bad at escaping. Um, and they kind of sting a little bit, so not good to have in the pharmacy, but every once in a while I may need to use it. Um, anywho, so three products here. We see uh, Leperudin, Bivalarudin, and Argatraban. These are going to be our three. Uh, we see here, notice that our monitoring is going to be with APTT, right? Because they're directly affecting factor 2A. So that's what you're going to be focusing on. Um, notice here that if you had a patient who had renal dysfunction, uh, Argatraban would probably be the better drug to go to because it doesn't have any appreciable renal excretion. Um, but again, a lot of times you're going to see these drugs either being used in things like uh, coronary angioplasty, uh, in the case of like, you know, PCI, you have like stent placement, you might see it used in, in the intermedium. Um, and then you can also see it used after HIT. So a lot of places have protocols where if you have HIT uh, suspected, you switch them over to one of these direct thrombin inhibitors, right? Uh, the next anticoagulant we'll talk about, uh, I'll spend probably a decent amount of time on this, is going to be warfarin. Uh, if anyone wonders where the name came from, it actually stands for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. Who knew? Um, it was actually discovered uh, at Wisconsin uh, University, and basically what um, they ended up finding was that they were having these uh, hemorrhagic disorders in these cattle. Uh, and then from there, we actually utilized it as a rodenticide for a good long time. Um, we actually still use uh, warfarin uh, products as rodenticides, so if you ever see like um, uh, dicumarol, things like that. Um, those are uh, warfarin products that, that are very specific for um, working uh, against uh, rodents and we have a very long half-life. But um, essentially what we see here is that warfarin comes as a racemic mixture, um, but just know that there is some difference in activity between the S enantiomer and the, right, uh, and the R enantiomer. Um, S enantiomer being much more potent as an anticoagulant, and that's going to be important when we talk about certain drug interactions we're going to uh, come across. Uh, so the way that this drug is going to work, it's going to be a vitamin K antagonist. So what we end up seeing is that once your body uh, absorbs vitamin K from the GI tract, it is utilized to help produce a lot of the clotting factors um, that we uh, rely upon to, to maintain hemostasis. So um, most notably protein uh, factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. And they will also end up affecting protein C and S as well. Um, these are all affected, uh, all synthesized in the liver, which again is why if you have a patient with really bad liver dysfunction, you end up seeing um, INR start to increase. You see clotting um, uh, disorders because they, they don't produce as much clotting factors within the liver. Um, warfarin does the same thing here by preventing uh, this reduction of vitamin K. It can't be utilized to produce new clotting factors. So. Um, Keep in mind that this is only affecting the production of new factors. It doesn't affect factors that have already been produced and are in circulating in the bloodstream, right? So if you're looking at um, onset of action, if you're comparing heparin versus warfarin, warfarin would be faster or slower? Right, much slower than a heparin because heparin is directly inactivating uh, with the help of antithrombin-3, those clotting factors that have already been produced. This is just preventing the new production of new clotting factors, right? So initially when you put on warfarin, you don't end up seeing an initial anticoagulant effect. It, usually you're going to end up seeing it, say, a day or two, um, say, usually for full effect, like three to five days before you really see full effects on, on the, on the um, 
the INR, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but that's why if you had, say, like a kid who ingested um, some morphine or some rodenticide um, calling the poison center, oftentimes we don't recommend they do anything for the first 24 hours. We'd actually tell them to go into the ER to get their INR checked the next day because that's how long it's going to end up taking for a lot of these clotting factors to be depleted in the bloodstream um, and to have this inhibition effect really take hold. That makes sense? Maybe. Hopefully. Just another picture kind of showing the, the mechanism of action here again. The warfarin specifically working as a vitamin K um, oxide reductase inhibitor. Um, so again, we're going to end up seeing uh, that we're decreasing vitamin K synthesis, you know, right around um, pretty significantly, again, decreasing your, your clotting factors around 30 to 50 percent or so. Um, again, no effect on, on already made clotting factors and that leads to that delay in onset of action. Uh, looking at the half-life, it's important to note here that some, not all you know, clotting factors are uh, created equally. You see they have pretty wide ranges in, in the half-life of these drugs or the different products. Um, notice here that protein C, which we said was an anticoagulant, um, has a shorter half-life, probably the shortest half-life, which means that initially you can end up seeing an actual uh, increase in clotting effect due to warfarin in the very early periods of, of administering it. So in a lot of cases, what you end up having, especially if you have a patient who um, had a clot, and they're going to be transitioned over to long-term prevention of clots with warfarin, which you end up seeing is that they'll be on a heparin product, say Lovenox or Noxaparin, um, and then you start the warfarin at the same time, and then you're going to bridge therapy for a few days until their INR is, is therapeutic. So essentially by using two drugs at the same time, you give the warfarin time to really um, get over that initial procoagulant hump and then get to the point where it's depleting a lot of those cofactors. And then you can take off the heparin and you have the full anticoagulant effect of the warfarin, right? So anytime you see bridge therapy, you know, it's not a therapeutic duplication. It's actually being done um, uh, quite thoughtfully because of that effect, that delayed onset of action. That makes sense? Okay. Um, so don't ever, you know, freak out if you see someone who's on heparin and warfarin at the same time. That's usually what they're doing is bridging them over until the, the warfarin is being therapeutic. Um, okay. So warfarin uh, is given orally, so it's very well absorbed. Um, it has a fairly long half-life for the most part because, again, most of it's staying in the liver. Uh, it's pretty lipophilic, so it hangs around for, for quite some period of time. Um, also, it's very highly bound to albumin as well, so you can end up seeing some uh, potential uh, protein-binding interactions here if someone were to come kick it off the, the protein. Um, and the other thing to note are going to be the, uh, the SIP interactions. We said the S enantiomer of warfarin is going to be much more active, and so this is affected by 2C9. So not only if you have drugs that come along that inhibit 2C9, will that lead to kind of enhanced effect of warfarin, but some people actually have uh, different pharmacogenetic mutations in their 2C9, which will make them more or less active. And so you may have somebody who has kind of underperforming 2C9, where they're not metabolizing as quickly, where they may be more sensitive to warfarin. Some people are much more resistant to warfarin because they have a 2C9 that works very, very well and metabolize it very quickly. Um, the RNA enchimer is can be affected by, say, 1A2 and 3A4, so you may still have some drug interactions there, but they won't be as severe as something that affects 2C9. Um, again, this is going to be uh, contraindicated in pregnancy because it does cause some fetal risk. Um, so don't use this. Use heparin if you had a uh, you know, pregnant lady you were worried about clotting in. Um, probably not good to use in breast milk either, but uh, it's not really found all that too much there, so um, maybe may an option there. So, uh, drug interactions. There's lots, lots of the drug interactions that are happening. Um, obviously, the way to overcome the effects of warfarin are just to consume more vitamin K, right? Because vitamin K is really, or warfarin is really only in inhibiting the recycling of vitamin K, right? So, if I give more brand new vitamin K to the body, I can overcome that effect for, for quite some time. So, um, where are some places we can find vitamin K? Green leafies. Green leafies like what? Spinach. Spinach. Kale. Kale. Broccoli, things like that. Um, lots of different things that can uh, contain lots of vitamin K, and so it's really, really important. It's why patient education is so huge um, for warfarins because uh, if you don't know how your diet's affecting your warfarin, you can really have lots of big changes in, in their INR from from time period to time period. Um, but certainly, things that will decrease the action of warfarin. So anything that's um, you know giving me more vitamin K. So certainly, if I'm intaking more in my diet, um, that would certainly make warfarin less effective. So typically, you see the INR go down. If you had someone who started, say, a new spinach diet where they're having spinach, you know, twice a day, every single day. Um, and then anything that's going to be affecting the synthesis function or clearance of the clotting factors um, could lead to decreased actions. The other thing you should really worry about, though, are going to be things that um, make warfarin more effective or have increased actions. So anything inhibiting CYP2C9, 
that would be an important drug interaction to be aware of. Um, anything kicking warfarin off of albumin, because again, drug that is uh, not bound to uh, serum proteins is going to be pharmacologically active, so that's something to note there. Um, anything that reduces the amount of vitamin K that I'm uh, absorbing from the GI tract can be important here as well. So uh, for instance, gut bacteria, the normal gut flora are really important for processing vitamin K and helping to absorb it. So this is where you see a lot of drug interactions come up with antibiotics, especially things like Bactrim, um, which can lead to not only through a SIP interaction, but you can also have um, the gut flora not producing as much vitamin K that we can readily absorb. And so less vitamin K, warfarin's gonna be working that much better. And so you end up seeing um, increased bleed risk there. And then um, any significant amount of uh, liver dysfunction um, can also uh, lead to better warfarin activity because again, you're not producing as many clotting factors. And then just the elderly tend, tend to be a little bit more um, sensitive to the effects as well. So uh, I kind of alluded to it already, but the way we monitor uh, warfarin's effects is by looking at the PTINR. Uh, so essentially, PT is, is a, the actual measurement that you're doing on the blood to see the, the clotting, uh, how well it works. Um, but we need to have some way to standardize it so that when you compare um, PTs from different organizations, uh, you have kind of the same result. And this is where the INR really comes from. Um, and this is based on the reagents that they're using. So essentially, you'll get your, your lab test done where they measure the PT and then they'll multiply it. Um, you'll take the patient uh, value, they'll divide it by the kind of the reference value for PT, kind of the normal, and then they'll multiply by this international sensitivity index. And that's going to be different between every assay for PT. And when they multiply by that, you end up getting your INR. And so that, that's that internationalized normal, um, international normalized ratio is what that stands for. So INR is really the value you're going to be looking at. And so because it's a ratio, very similar to how you saw with APTT, you might be measuring it as a ratio uh, compared to a normal. So uh, INR is usually expressed as, you know, say, if you're not taking warfarin, INR should probably be what? One, right? It's 100%. You're clotting just like you normally should. Um, if it was, you know, once you start to have warfarin, you start to see the INR start to go up because your PT time is increasing, right? Because you're depleting those clotting factors. Um, so typically what you end up seeing is that most patients will have an indication of, say, two to three. Right, so that's the, the number you're going to be really looking for is you should have an INR between two and three. Um, you know, say you had AFib and you're doing it for prevention of, of uh, stroke risk or um, previous DVTs, things like that, um, you'd be put on warfarin with an indication of say two to three. There are indications where you'd want a little bit higher INR, so especially if you have like a mechanical heart valve, that would be, uh, uh, you'd have an even higher risk of clotting, so they want even a bigger anticoagulant effect, so that's where you'd shoot for a little bit higher effect. But usually two to three is the number you're going to be looking for with, with uh, PTINR. Um, some patients may just have warfarin resistance as well. A lot of that can be due to some uh, different uh, enzyme uh, pharmacogenetic differences in some of the alleles there. Um, but for the most part, the mechanical heart valve is probably the biggest ones you want to be looking for to have that higher INR. Um, like I said, some people may be more sensitive to the effects of warfarin, especially if they have kind of uh, a less efficient metabolism through CYP2C9. So something like 10 to 20% of Caucasians may have issues with this, um, a little bit less frequent in African Americans. Um, but certainly it's something that you, um, this is why warfarin is so important to do kind of individualized monitoring with. And we do therapeutic drug monitoring of this drug because um, every patient's a little bit different with warfarin. Um, certainly I had patients who, and you know, this is where a lot of pharmacy clinics come in, into place where you can do um, pharmacists run like anticoagulation clinics. Um, so I, I did a lot of that in my uh, rotations and you'd see all kinds of different patients who would have different um, kind of circumstances that lead them to be more or less sensitive to the effects of warfarin. So one lady had a uh, factor five Leiden deficiency. Um, she was very, very difficult to control because sometimes she'd come in with the INR4 and then the next time she'd come in with the INR1. Um, and you just really couldn't have a good, uh, good sense of that. An HIV patient who had, um, he, a lot of those uh, HIV medications are SIP inducers. So he was actually hyper metabolizing his warfarin. And so a normal patient may be on say five milligrams of warfarin a day. We had him up to like 25 milligrams of warfarin a day and still having a hard time getting him therapeutic. So everyone's a little bit different. And that's why it's so important to individualize everything to, uh, to your patient. And then you also have to look at the diet. So, um, you know, I did this, uh, my, my clinic work in, in Palaka, Florida, where, you know, it's like just, real southern people out there and so you know <laughs> a lot of collard greens a lot of a lot of spinach and stuff like that you know um and so their diets are really important to, to counsel them on that because you know it's not the fact that you can't have green leafy vegetables it's just you have to be consistent because you're dosing to that consistency and so if they go from having a bunch of, of spinach one week and the INR comes back one 
uh, and then I increase my dose to account for that and they stop eating all that spinach, now all of a sudden I can end up tipping the scale the other direction and they end up coming back with, with you know, bruising, bleeding, things like that, right? So that's why it's really, really important to counsel them to just be consistent with their <laughs> diet, try to keep about the same you know, daily or weekly amount of you know, green leafy vegetables that they're, they're intaking. Um, like we said, bleeding uh, is going to be one of the, the biggest side effects we're going to be looking at. Um, usually if you have you know, your r, &R within range, say you know, between two, three and a half, um, you know, less than 5%. It's when you start to really start getting above that is when you see increased risk for things like intracranial hemorrhage, um, you know, bleeding basically from anywhere is possible. Um, and so the way that we're going to uh, reverse the effects of vi or vitamin K antagonists like warfarin is by either one, giving more vitamin K, right? Um, but is that an immediate effect? I'm asking questions, probably not, right? Um, because it takes time for the vitamin K to be utilized to produce new clotting factors. So that's not an immediate effect, it takes time. Um, but the other thing that I can do that's immediate is to give factors, right? So I can give either fresh frozen plasma, I can give um, uh, uh, protein concentrate, so I can and give factor concentrated products. Um, all of those things will directly reverse the, the anticoagulant effects of warfarin. So say if I had a patient who had a high INR, and again, there's, there's good guidelines. If you look at the chest guidelines, like those are the, the kind of the king for anticoagulation guidelines. So I certainly recommend you taking a look at those. Um, just chest, um, they, they put them out every so frequently, but just look up chest guidelines and you'll find all this stuff. Um, you know, say they have a high INR, but they're not having any actual bleeds, you can maybe give away, you know, give some, some oral vitamin K or, you know, adjust their dose or things like that. But if they're having any actual bleed or the number is very, very high, you would actually end up giving um, either sub-Q, IM, or intravenous vitamin K to get them started, but then you're also going to give them actual co um, cofactors in order to help uh, overcome that, that anticoagulant effect. So that's where you get the fresh frozen plasma um, to them to help give them the factors they need. Does that make sense, the treatment? So kind of two reversal things you might, you'll see there, either get the factors or get the vitamin K. Um, certainly birth defects are possible. So again, it's contraindicated for pregnant patients. And then um, you can also end up seeing uh, skin necrosis that can occur, but more especially in patients who have, say, a protein C or S deficiency, they may be more prone to this as well. So, um, warfarin therapy, we see that it's highly diet dependent. So that's kind of a problem. Uh, we know we need to have frequent monitoring of the medication. So again, that's you know problem because you have to have patients sometimes come in every single week for several weeks until you get them stabilized. Um, lots of drug interactions based on CYP2C9 interactions and things like that. Um, benefit though, it's easily reversible. Right? It's kind of a nice nice thing to that. Um, we do have some new alternatives. So I've listed three here that we'll talk more about in detail. Um, but these are oral alternatives to warfarin. That they, uh, they, their proposed benefit is they don't really require as much monitoring because they don't need to have INR um, checked as, uh, at all. So we'll talk about these and why that is in a second. So the first one is going to be dabigatran or Pradaxa. So this one is actually an oral direct thrombin inhibitor. So it works similar to like our Argatraban or Leperudin as a direct thrombin inhibitor. Um, so by inhibiting factor 2A, you prevent fibrinogen from getting converted over to fibrin, which helps to inhibit a lot of the other clotting factors from being activated uh, as well. Um, so because of that, we don't have to do any routine monitoring of it. It's pretty standard dosing for the medication. Um, it is renally eliminated. So it would be one thing you'd want to uh, make sure that your patients who are of renal dysfunction need to be dose adjusted for. Um, and for a long time, we didn't actually have any reversal agents for this drug, which is a big, huge problem because, um, you know, warfarin, someone comes in with a head bleed, I can reverse it pretty easily. Uh, someone came in with a dabigatran overdose or uh, dabigatran toxicity, um, I had no way to reverse that. Even if I give factors, um, because it's still inhibiting direct, uh, factor two, uh, it didn't really matter because it was still having that the very same anticoagulant effect. So it doesn't matter how much factors I push into them, it didn't work. So that was a big problem. Um, but fortunately, the manufacturers of Dabigatran actually end up coming out with their own reversal agent. I don't know if there's any uh, financial incentive there, but um, essentially what they did was they actually produced a monoclonal antibody and so this is Idaru, uh, you'll find that monoclonal antibodies are very difficult to say, but <laughs> Idaru Sizumab, or Praxbind, essentially what it's going to do is it's an antibody that's been tuned directly against the uh, bigotran, so it'll actually go up and bind it and then activate it directly. So then your factor 2A can, can start to work again. So it's very similar to how you'd see something like, um, uh, like snake antivenom actually work, where it actually binds directly to the, to the molecule that it's um, trying to target and prevents it from having further clinical effect. Um, so that's a new agent, uh, relatively new. Again, it's going to be very, very expensive to have on hand, and so it would be very difficult to say, you know, you know, large teaching institution, yeah, you might have it on hand. Uh, you go out to Podunk, you know, Panhandle of Florida, 
maybe not, right? Um, because it's very difficult for you know, to for them to you know say, hey, let's keep this how many ever thousand dollar drug on hand just in case someone comes in with dabigatran toxicity, right? So sometimes it's hard to justify um, the cost depending on, on how much it really is. So something to keep in mind, but that's out there now. Um, so again, it's dialyzable, um, which may be useful in some cases, but for the most part, if your patient has um, uh, renal dysfunction, you know, make sure you're dose adjusting for that. Otherwise, it could be more at risk for bleeding. <laughs> some other drugs we have, uh, rivaroxaban or Xarelto. Uh, this is an oral factor 10A inhibitor. So it's very similar to what we see with um, your Arixtra, that fund of Paranux, except this is an oral product that's available. Um, again, it can be used for things like DVT, AFib, you know, prevention of clot, pulmonary embolism. Um, again, also no routine monitoring being done. You could probably do an anti-factor 10A, but routinely you don't need to um, for a lot of your patients. Um, again, this uh, potentially could be reversed with a prothrombin complex concentrate, which is basically just, you know, if you look at fresh frozen plasma, if you concentrate all the factors down uh, into one product, that's basically what that is, and that protein, uh, or prothrombin complex concentrate. So you do get some reversal effects from that. Um, one thing I uh, forgot to mention earlier is that we said the antidote for heparin is what? It says protamine. Um, protamine only partially reverses your low molecular weight heparins. So you may get some potential benefit from administering that if you had some bleed due to say like Lovenox administration. But um, for Arixtra or Fonda Paranox, it actually has no activity whatsoever. So um, again, for these factor 10A inhibitors, um, you end up having to give, basically kind of flood them with more, uh, more factors in order to kind of overcome that inhibition. Um, again, this one is renally eliminated, but no specific dose recommendation. So it might be better for patients who have some renal dysfunction. And then you have Apixaban or Eliquis, uh, which is another uh, direct 10A inhibitor. Again, used for things like DVT, AFib, pulmonary embolism. Um, no routine monitoring uh, needed for this one as well, which again is another benefit over warfarin. Uh, but bleeding risk is also gonna be one of your big concerns there, but it could be reversed potentially by the, the same route. Um, this one is metabolized by CYP3A4. So no renal world concerns you have to worry about, but you do need to worry about CYP3A4 interactions. So if you had it on simvastatin, I'm sorry, if you're on like something like verapamil, tetiazem, that can interact with this in order to increase the bleed risk there. So be, be aware of those interactions. Okay, so that's it for the anticoagulants. Any questions on this section? We will do a review section for the next one, unless anyone is not wanting to do that. Yeah, you probably do. Um, so we'll do a review on the next session. If you have any questions, feel free to send them to me in the meantime. I'll see you next time.